joint. It started, so you'll start to see the people come in. Oh, okay, wonderful. guys, I, uh, welcome. <laughs> My name is Amanda Moore, and we are here for the third night of the 2021 ASF virtual conference. I am so excited to see all the people with us tonight. You are in for another wonderful evening of some amazing um, conversations and some amazing um, feedback from this wonderful panel. Before I get started, I'll have to, I always have to say, we are in a campaign, right, Liz? And you're gonna get so <laughs> sick of hearing this, but we're in the middle of a campaign and we're incredibly excited about it. It's called Express Feedback for Good. We're announcing tomorrow that we're actually gonna do a contest. So everyone that signs up and gives 75 pieces of feedback will be in a drawing for a safety bed, for an iPad and for some other really cool things. So if you haven't signed up yet, all you have to do is text ASF to 90412. If you have signed up, all you gotta do is give that feedback and we have a chance to get up to $50,000. So we have till August 19th for that. So please do that if you can, that would be amazing. $50,000 would go a very long way for our organization. So, um, so yeah, I'm gonna stop talking because I know everyone is not here to see me. They're here to see these lovely individuals in front of me. And I'll start up by introducing our amazing clinic director here at the Angelman Syndrome Foundation, Liz Gelazzo. Liz Gelazzo, take it away. Awesome, thanks, Amanda. Um, I am Liz Gelazzo, as Amanda said, I am the clinic director of the Angel Foundation. I am um, a clinical geneticist at UNC, um, and I see patients through the UNC Angelman Syndrome Clinic and Duke 15 Clinic. Um, and I also um, am the parent of a child with Angelman Syndrome. So my six-year-old daughter, Evelyn, has Angelman Syndrome, which many of you already know. I'm joined tonight um, to discuss developing therapeutics for Angelman Syndrome by two fabulous scientists who don't really need an introduction, but I will briefly introduce them and then hand it over to them. So the topic of our um, discussion tonight, as I mentioned, is developing therapeutics. And our goal tonight is really to get your questions answered. So demystify the process, demystify some of the science so that when we're talking about therapeutic development and we're talking about different clinical trials or drugs that you might be seeing or different research opportunities, um, you have a good foundational understanding of what all of those mean. Um, so don't be shy, ask questions. You can use the Q&A chat box. We will be monitoring that and I will um, be facilitating questions um, or use the chat bar either way. Um, tonight I'm joined, like I said, by Stormy Chamberlain, who is um, an associate professor of genetics at University of Connecticut. And I've tasked her tonight with kind of giving us an overview of the basic science here. So what we know about UB3A, what is UB3A? What does UB3A do? UBE Why did we think that um, reactivating paternal UB3A or um, giving back UB3A might be a therapeutic option for Angelman syndrome. Um, and then we're going to shift gears a little bit. And um, I'm also joined by Dr. Lynn Bird, who's a professor of pediatrics, as well as clinical geneticist at Rady Children's Hospital um, in San Diego, who um, has been a principal investigator on the natural history trial for um, a few decades now, a couple of decades now. So I've tasked her with kind of giving an overview of natural history study. We've heard a lot about these buzzwords. What is the natural history study? What have we learned from the natural history study and why is that important for developing therapeutics? So I'll turn it over to Stormy and we'll get started. Right. Sharing my screen. It looks good. All right. So, uh, you know, I hope that a lot of this is review for you guys. Um, you're experts in Angelman syndrome by virtue of having a child and needing to understand this. Um, so, you know, this serves as a, a foundation um, for other things that we'll talk about tonight. So as you all know, Angelman syndrome is caused by the loss of UBE3A, a gene, in neurons. Um, so in typical individuals, UBE3A, uh, is expressed only for mom's copy of chromosome 15 in neurons. Dad's copy is silenced. And how this works is that um, a long non-coding RNA that starts at SNRP-N um, and your child may have been tested for methylation 
um, it's this methylation mark that's indicated by these lollipops here. Um, your child um, has a, typical children have a paternal allele, paternal copy and a maternal copy. Mom's copy is methylated, dad's copy is unmethylated and the unmethylated copy, the dad's copy makes a long non-coding RNA that silences dad's copy of UBE3A. And that's how it gets shut off, okay? And that leaves mom's copy as the only made copy, if you will. It's the only source of UBE3A um, in neurons. And that's in all typical individuals, you and I, and everybody else we know. So Angelman syndrome occurs when the mom's copy of UBE3A, so when I say mom's copy, I mean the copy that was inherited from mom, um, when it's deleted or um, broken, if you will. So this can happen in a variety of ways. Um, most of your children have a large deletion of 15 Q11 to Q13. This is uh, like five to seven million base pair deletion on mom's copy of chromosome 15. Um, some of your children might have a UBE3A mutation. That means that there's a, you know, a small DNA change in, the mat in mom's copy um, of UBE3A, the maternally inherited copy of UBE3A that renders it non-functional or less than um, typical functional. And then there are others of you who may have uh, uniparental disomy. That means your child has two chromosomes 15 from dad. So that means both copies are shut off by this antisense transcript, by this non-coding RNA, this thing that shuts off UBE3A on dad's copy. And a few of you may have um, an imprinting defect. And that means although your child has a copy of chromosome 15 from mom and a copy from dad, mom's copy behaves as if it were inherited from dad. And so it also shuts off UBE3A. So, what exactly is UBE3A? Well, I've, I've used the word a couple of times and I didn't really tell you exactly what I meant by that. So UBE3A is, uh, when we talk about the gene, it's actually DNA, okay? And as you all know, that's the blueprint by which, um, the DNA is the blueprint by which our cells build more cells and eventually build a whole human. But UBE3A is one specific segment of DNA. And this DNA, um, is a template to make UBE3A RNA. It's also called UBE3A. And so sometimes we're not very clear about whether we're talking about the gene, the RNA, or UBE3A protein. This RNA actually encodes the UBE3A protein. So UBE3A can be used to describe any of these three, the DNA, the RNA, or the protein, okay? Uh, and, and we need to care about all of them at the end of the day. Um, but ultimately it's the loss of UBE3A protein that causes Angelman syndrome. So UBE3A protein labels other proteins to be discarded. Um, so in this uh, diagram, which can be found on the, the University of Florida um, pediatrics website, I've always found it useful for the 20 years or so that I've been working in the area. It's a little bit complicated, but um, UBE3A sits at the center of this diagram. And what it does is it's a complicated protein that brings um, a label, which is ubiquitin, onto another protein that needs to be trashed, okay? And so it's labeling the proteins in the cell, in the neuron, that need to be thrown away. And we need to throw away you, uh, proteins, just like we need to take the trash out of our house, okay? If, if we didn't take the trash out in our own homes, um, it would become messy and we would become non-functional because we couldn't eventually get out the door. I'm thinking about that uh, Shel Silverstein poem about Sarah Cynthia Stout or whatnot. Anyhow, um, so UBE3A is needed to send these proteins to the trash, okay? So why am I telling you all of this stuff that you probably already know? Well, that's because the therapeutic approaches um, that, that we're going to be talking about tonight primarily put back that UBE3A protein. So it puts back this protein in, um, into neurons and that's the overall goal. We can do this by a couple of ways. Um, the one that you've probably heard a lot about so far are um, ASOs. This stands for antisense oligonucleotide. Um, they might go by a few other names too, but ASOs, I think, is, is pretty much an all-encompassing one that's been used most. Um, and the reason how they work is that um, 
So remember I told you that dad's copy of UBE3A is silenced. Well, it's actually silenced because the machinery making UBE3A collides with the machinery that makes the antisense RNA. OK, so this is I like to view this as two trains on the same track because it really isn't far from the truth. Um, these machineries collide. And for whatever reason, the antisense train always wins. OK, and what ASOs do is ASOs cut this antisense uh, uh, RNA. Um, and that causes the the machinery that's making the antisense. To be kicked off the track. OK. And then UBE3A can be made. Okay, it prevents this collision. Um, and so ASOs are being pursued as a therapeutic approach um, by uh, Ionis and Biogen, Roche and Genetics Ultragenics um, partnerships. Okay, so that's how ASOs work. And be sure to ask a question if, if some of this isn't clear. We're really using these ASOs to prevent the collision between the antisense and UBE3A. With, with that in mind, um, you know, we think of other ways uh, we, I mean scientists in general, because there's a lot of us scientists working in this area. Um, we look for other ways to prevent this collision as well. And so obviously the other way to prevent this collision is simply to put up a stop sign and stop this antisense transcript midstream, right? Um, and that antisense, if you stop the antisense, you can also prevent the collision. So um, Mark Zilka's group at UNC does this using um, something called CRISPR. CRISPR has been in the news for a lot of different things, but in, in our case, CRISPR can be used in two different ways. CRISPR-Cas9 can cut the DNA and insert the stop sign. Um, and so it inserts new DNA that stops uh, the cell from making the antisense transcript. So it really is a stop sign. Um, and the other approach he's using is dead Cas9. And this is like, sticking up a wall, a, a, a ginormous speed bump that really stops this antisense machinery um, from making the antisense, from overlapping with UBE3A. And those are how the CRISPR approaches that we've, we've heard about so far work. And we just heard um, in the scientific conference some really exciting work on that. Hey, Stormy. Yes. We've got a great question here. Awesome. The audience, how does this collision happen? And is it an ongoing thing or does it only happen once? Oh, that's an excellent question. So um, this, this collision is ongoing um, in, in each of our brains, all of us typical individuals, all of your angels, um, your, this collision is going on constantly. There are multiple, I drew this as one train, but really there's a lot of trains. There's a lot of machineries making the antisense and there's a lot of trains loading up to making UBE3A. And again, this is all on dad's copy of chromosome 15. So there's this constant collision going on. And so um, that's wonderful and a curse, right? Um, the wonderful part of this is, is that UBE3A is always trying to make its way down the track. No matter how old we are, this is always happening. Um, the curse part about it is, is that um, we have to stop this antisense throughout life in order to get it to work. Okay, there's not a magical point at which the antisense quits working. Um, so um, I hope that answered the question. It's great, thanks. Um, so another approach that you'll hear talked about um, is AAV mediated gene therapy. That's a big word. Um, and you probably haven't heard of, heard those words straight, strung together. You might've heard gene therapy. Um, this is a, these are approaches that are used by um, companies like PTC Therapeutics or Ask Bio, um, uh, Ovid and Tasha. I don't think they've used that word really so far, but um, PTC and, um, and ask bio certainly use this word um, gene therapy. Um, and what this means is, so AAV is, stands for adeno associated virus. Um, you don't need to know that. You need to know that um, really uh, this is a shell from a harmless virus and it's used to deliver uh, payloads. It's used to deliver either UBE3A, the gene itself, or it's used to deliver something that will stop the antisense. And the reason we want to do this is because it allows very long lasting production from its payload. So it's delivering this DNA. And as long as this DNA gets there, it's able to be produced uh, 
for a very long time. We don't know exactly how long, but we know it's probably like decades. And so here you see a diagram of what an AAV capsid looks like. Capsid means the shell of this virus. They've stripped out all of the genes that make it a virus. Um, I should say most of the genes that make it a virus. And they replace them with uh, the DNA that we want. Um, and so we can insert the DNA here um, in this top case. And when we insert this UBE3A gene, the cell now produces, so it now has the DNA that's called UBE3A, which now produces the RNA that's called UBE3A, and then can be translated or um, encoded into the protein that is UBE3A from this gene that's, that's provided in the virus. And so these are called replacement therapies. And so it puts the gene back. Um, then the other, op the other um, approach is uh, something you've heard of maybe called shRNAs, which stands for short hairpin. Um, or microRNAs, and these are pursued by um, Ovid, Tasha, and then the um, Orphan Disease Center at uh, UPenn. Um, there's probably some others in the mix that may be thinking about this. And these work um, by cutting the, the RNA, the antisense RNA, a lot like ASOs, okay? So they make that cut and they stop the machinery that's making the antisense and therefore stop the collision, okay? So there's two different mechanisms here. There's two different ways that these work but they're both delivered by this Trojan horse virus, if you will. And so that's how they're delivered. And the reason we like them again is because it should be very long lasting. While we're on this topic here, before we get mm -hmm. into biomarkers, uh, and perhaps if we take a step back to, back to the ASOs, can you talk a little bit about modes of delivery for these sort of therapeutics? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, and so as of now, um, the mode of delivery for ASOs is really to, um, it is to inject them into the cerebral spinal fluid. And so this is like an epidural. Um, those of us who've had children and were too weak to try it pain-free, pain the whole real way, um, we, we had an epidural. And, and so this is very similar to that. Um, they'll deliver it through the CSF. Um, and, and by this epidural injection. Um, and so they do last a very long time. And we heard today that they probably last longer than we think they do. Um, by long time, I mean, one injection lasts at least four months or so. And so they may be stretching that out longer. And we learned also today in the scientific conference that the companies that are studying these ASOs um, are, are working on other ways to deliver them. Um, and whether it's um, an easier way to deliver them without the um, epidural or whether it's delivering them with different packaging, if you will. So it wouldn't involve a CSF injection at all. Um, those aren't ready yet. And so the trials that are ongoing will all involve this epidural injection. The CRISPR approach, um, this is delivered, um, this is going to be delivered most likely um, by an AAV vector too. This is a really big, um, to, to deliver a CRISPR to your cells is, is a big thing. Um, and so it probably has to be put on this Trojan horse AAV type virus, but it remains to be seen as they develop that further exactly how that will get in. And, um, and I should say that these AAV mediated gene therapies will also be delivered using an epidural type injection too, um, as, as far as we know. Um, there's some possibility of injecting them in the bloodstream, but um, from it's probably not practical and it's probably going to be the safest and the most um, efficient to do it into the CSF. Um, but the difference is, is that these should really take only a single injection um, for a very long lived um, uh, replacement of UBE3A, both the CRISPR strategy, both the CRISPR strategies and this AAV strategy, um, these gene replacement or shRNA um, type strategies. Are there any other questions about that? Someone just asked, what does ASO stand for? So if you want to... Yeah, I'll backtrack. ASO yeah, stands for antisense oligonucleotide. If we can break that, I love words actually. So <laughs> antisense, UVE3A is the sense. Um, it means that it's 
it, it's the sense. Um, and so the anti-sense means it goes opposite to UBE3A. Um, that's what anti-sense means. And so in this case, um, these anti-sense oligonucleotides, it doesn't actually refer to the anti-sense anti-sense. It, 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 it involves the RNA that it's recognizing. It's recognizing, um, it's an RNA that's anti-sense to the RNA it's trying to cut. Okay. And so um, the, so it's, an oligonucleotide is just a fancy word for multiple DNA bases. So it's a DNA based drug um, that cuts the RNA. And so ASO stands for antisense oligonucleotide. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions? Not at the moment. Okay. So now I'm going to get into, into uh, deep water for me, right? So. Um, the other thing that you'll hear about um, that was talked a lot about in the scientific meeting as well is something called biomarkers. And so in order to know whether or not um, a therapeutic that we're delivering to your individuals, whether it's doing its job, whether it's worth it, whether it's working, um, we have to have biomarkers. And um, people use this word um, I found for a lot of different things. Um, and so you kind of have to dig a little bit and ask, what do you mean by biomarker? And I think the word biomarker, um, in my mind, there's, there's two major uses of this word. And the first is, is that, um, um, first of all, we're looking for targets of UBE3A that might change when we restore UBE3A. Can we take blood? Can we take CSF? Can we take something else? Um, from your child that, that is non-invasive and, and um, is easy to do. Um, can we take that and see whether or not the therapeutic is actually functioning? Is the ASO or SHRNA actually cutting the antisense RNA? Or um, have we put UBE3A back um, on the AAV vector? Um, have we put it back using the CRISPR? Um, so we want to ask whether this therapeutic is functioning, right? And so that's the first step because we want to know that the drug is actually doing what everybody thinks it's doing. And we need some other measure to, to figure that out. Um, and so that's a biomarker for the drug function. The second use of biomarker is um, something that tells us in humans whether, um, whether the, the um, restoration of UBE3A, when we put it back, that it's improving something, that it's making a difference in your child. Um, and so um, this helps us understand whether the therapeutic is likely to improve Angelman syndrome. So we wanna see a change in your child's physiology. We wanna see a little change in their brain, a little change in something meaningful um, that helps tell us that, that the putting UBE3A back is having a good effect. And this is different. And so then there's gonna be one third word that you'll hear and that's called outcomes measures. And, and what those are, are going to be really functional improvements, things that are, um, improvements in your life, uh, quality of life, improvements in things that um, are difficult for children with Angelman syndrome. Um, and so the biomarkers need to be, um, are ideally, I don't know if they need to be, but they're ideally attached to an outcomes measure um, that ultimately tells us that we can see a change in your child and this change is beneficial. Um, and that and then ultimately we have something that says that it's the drug that's doing it, that the drug is functioning, uh, the functioning drug has changed something in your child that we can measure and see. Um, and then that that thing that we can measure and see is important and changes the quality of life for your child. And something that you may have heard about throughout this week or, or um, other conferences is the Angelman Biomarker and Outcome Measures Consortium, the ABOM. Um, and that's a group that's supported by the ASF and FAST um, to bring together a pre-competitive group of all the key relevant stakeholders, the um, pharmaceutical companies who are interested in developing therapeutics to do just that, to identify what are meaningful outcome measures and biomarkers in Angelman syndrome and make sure that what we're measuring is actually things that are important for families as well. Um, Dr. Bird, I'm going to make you answer that question publicly because uh, it was a really great question that a, a lot of other people are probably wondering as well. So the question that kept came up in the question and answer box was, um, are there are these therapies specific for a, a certain genotype in Angelman syndrome or, or are each of these therapies going to be for all patients? So um, <clears throat> right now, 
um, these therapies, ASOs, are being tried just in um, a couple of groups, the deletion group and the group that has UBE3A mutations. And the reason for that is that those two types of Angelman syndrome have only one gene that you might be able to reactivate, whereas UPD and imprinting defects have two sleeping gene copies that you could potentially reactivate. And the concern is that what if we do too good a job and we overexpress um, the gene um, because we, we have a pretty good idea that the gene needs to be fairly tightly regulated in terms of amount. So too little is not good, too much is not good either. So to minimize that risk, um, the initial studies are just being done in those who have only a single um, sleeping gene to be awakened. Wonderful, perfect. Thank you for that explanation. And thank you, Stormy. I should also say, um, you know, that was really meant to be a high level overview, certainly not exhaustive of all the different therapeutics that are in the pipeline. There are many, many, many more. These are just um, things that you might've heard a lot about over the last, you know, couple of days at the conference. Are there other specific questions about what Stormy has gone over um, before we switch gears a little bit? And we can always go back to, to um, questions for her section as well afterwards. Stormy, um, would you mind just talking maybe about what you are most excited about when it comes to research for this community? Like what's the thing that our community should be doing toe touches about tonight because it's exciting? Well, so my takeaway from the scientific meeting and, and mind you, I'm a scientist, so that's, that's my bias, um, is from the scientific conference, I thought that it looked like we finally put all of the pieces together. Okay, we have a couple of therapeutic approaches and um, I, I love sports analogies. We have multiple shots on goal, um, multiple different ways that we can figure out how to turn on UBE3A or deliver UBE3A. Um, and we have a lot of different companies interested in it that all come at it from a slightly different angle. And then we have some of these biomarkers that we're talking about. We have a biomarker uh, that we saw the first report, I think, of a biomarker that says that the drug is working that, or that we could use to say that the drug might be working. Um, and then we have the first report, I think, of another biomarker that suggests that it might that um, you there's a there's something that you could measure in children that changes with their severity. And that the idea with that is is that if you put the drug back, or sorry, if you put UBE3A back, you'd be able to see that change as well. So I, I feel like we finally have these pieces all together, and so I, I can see a way forward, which is brilliant, right? Um, that's what I'm most excited about right now. Love it. Thank you. I agree. Toe touches for multiple shots on goal. That's, that's all we've heard <laughs> the last couple of days. Amen. All right, we have some good, some good questions rolling in here. So does the length of the deletion affect the therapy? Uh, so since the therapeutic approaches, so that's a really good question, actually. So since the, the therapeutic approaches all address UBE3A, um, they are... <sighs> Paradoxically, they're the, probably the most helpful for individuals with UBE3A mutations because they're really putting back the only thing that's missing. Your children with deletions um, have a few other genes. They're not totally deleted. They're missing um, one of two copies of them, but they make a little bit of those proteins from another copy of the gene. Um, and so, um, so, the, so the ASO won't fix those other genes for instance, nor will the replacement therapy, um, nor will the CRISPR approaches. Um, however, we've also learned, so within that deletion class, we've also learned from um, papers published this year, this wasn't talked about at the research symposium, but um, papers published this year suggest that really those with the, with the smaller deletion, the type two deletion, aren't really a whole lot different from those with the larger deletion. And that's encouraging too. So, um, but, but those are some of the caveats. We just put back UBE3A and so there's more research to be done um, to figure out what those other genes are contributing to the disorder. Great, thanks. All right, and a question about the anticipated side effects of either ASOs or gene therapies. Ooh, side effects. Uh, 
well, that's not talked about. Um, no, and, and I, I think it's an important topic because um, it's not fair to say that there aren't any. Um, they, they, um, I was encouraged today to hear um, the, the uh, industry partners talk about how careful they've been to look at safety and toxicity for their ASOs. Um, and, and, um, and we're not talking about gene therapies yet or um, CRISPR approaches because I don't think they've gotten there or at least aren't publicly talking about it yet, about um, safety just yet. I know it's in the top of their minds and I'm grateful that these companies are all taking their time and, and um, making sure everything is safe. Um, so I personally can't speak to a lot of the side effects um, as a non-physician, um, but I was encouraged to hear how careful they've been in looking for side effects and toxicities. I was going to say, Dr. Bird, you probably get this question often in clinics as you're counseling families about thinking about participating in these clinical trials. How would you answer that question? So the truth is, is we don't know because these are first in human trials. So these are, these are drugs that have never been used in a human being ever previously. So in some ways, you really can't answer the question about what to expect. We can um, extrapolate probably a little bit from the experience of using ASOs in other, um, in other disorders. You may have heard about SMA or spinal muscular atrophy a very successful story of how an ASO has really changed the natural history of that condition. Um, and so we have some sense of a safety profile from, from uh, the drug, the ASO used to treat spinal muscular atrophy. Um, but you know, I'm sure not all ASOs are created equal and we probably can't, um, we can be a little comforted by um, the safety profile of that drug um, in, in thinking that we might um, have a similar experience. But the truth is, is we're going to have to do the studies to know what the side effects are. Great. I think that's really helpful for our families to hear. All right. Other questions from the community? Oh, here we go. Have there been animal trials with these molecules already? And what were the safety safety profiles in these models and any side effects in mice? Good question. That's an excellent question. Um, so to my understanding, um, so with the ASOs, uh, to my knowledge, there weren't any negative side effects in the mouse. Um, and from what I understand, the non-human primates, so they've tested these in uh, rhesus macaque monkeys in most cases, um, I think in all cases, um, they haven't seen um, any side effects in the monkeys, um, but there was a robust discussion about how the monkeys don't always predict what the side effects would be in humans. And so um, that's important. Um, we did hear a little bit today about potential side effects from um, AAV mediated gene therapy. And I think what's beautiful about that is, is that knowing up front, and, and in, in this case, it may very well have been um, how the injection works and, and it's, you know, people in the lab doing this to mice as opposed to skilled um, physicians doing this for children. And ultimately um, AAV would also be delivered in the uh, CSF. And so in this case, the mouse, they delivered it to the brain directly. Um, so um, there weren't anything, there wasn't anything in the animals that m makes us worry yet. Um, and that's, I think, great news. That's about, you know, that's the best we can do at this point. And so, I, like I said, everybody's being very careful moving forward, safety-wise. Oh, and Becky, um, Becky Burdine uh, may have corrected me. Indeed, there was some discussion today that in the non-human primate studies and the toxicity studies, they did see some of this transient ataxia or kind of wobbly gait after the initial injections that was short-lived. Um, gone in a day, I think they said. Yes. And it indeed resolved. All right. Um, what, so a good question here about what outcome measures, um, it says, what outcome measures are you hoping for with the ASO? So what, what sort of outcome measures are, are studies looking at with the ASOs? Well, they're looking at a variety of performance um, measures. We're, we're hoping to measure stuff that um, 
is first and foremost actually important to families, but also things that uh, unfortunately that the FDA wants to see. Um, so um, some of the studies, I, I think most of them are looking at um, performance as measured by the Bailey scales of infant development, the Vineland adaptive behavior scales, um, I, a special language tool um, that was developed um, with Angelman syndrome in mind called the ORCA, it's a communication scale. Um, we're also looking at um, measures of sleep um, uh, measures of um, motor and intellectual and language performance. It's a really a wide um, range. And, and trying to capture, of course, we have to capture all the um, untoward symptoms. You know, we, we hope there's not going to be an exacerbation of seizures, but obviously that's something we're cataloging. Um, whenever anybody experiences any kind of event, um, there are diaries where parents are capturing, um, you know, if their child's had a seizure, um, diaries to look at how sleep is going. And that seems like a whole lot of outcome measures and it, and it actually is. And this is a common theme that you may hear throughout phase one or these first in human clinical trials where we don't know exactly which measures we might see improvements in. And so there's a lot of information gathered about a lot of different measures to be able to see what effects we, we might see from a therapeutic. All right, this is, there's two questions back to back here about um, age ranges for the clinical trials. So um, the, the questions are about um, would adult patients be able to participate, adults in the age range of say 35 to 45, and might we expect to see changes in older adults with Angelman syndrome from these therapeutics? Well, um, so <clears throat> the, I believe that um, a couple of days ago, um, Ionis and Biogen released <clears throat> a bit of information about their inclusion criteria. So they're gonna have quite a broad age range as I understand it, potentially age two to 50. Um, the studies that are out there now have been, have been restricted, more restricted in age to, um, to children. Yeah, so that was really exciting to see that there will be a, a broader age range, hopefully anticipated in this upcoming clinical trial. Um, um, in terms of whether or not we can expect any improvement um, from adults treated, first of all, we don't know that it works in anybody. Um, but secondly, um, I mean, there's, in my mind, reason to hope that there might be um, some benefit because um, the data show that UBE3A is expressed throughout life. Um, so if it were only something that was expressed you know, in the fetal period or only in the newborn period or only in the first three years of life, we would probably not have much hope that we'd see benefit in, um, in adults where they're not even expressing UB3 anymore. But that doesn't seem to be the case. It does seem to be expressed throughout life. Um, so I think that that alone um, gives us reason to think there could potentially be benefit. And I'll add to that in the mouse model, they were able to restore, um, you know, the neuron uh, functions that relate to learning and memory at any age when they put UBE3A back into the mouse model. And, and so I think that also contributes to, to Lynn's optimism that, that um, you know, we should, we should hope that, that it could be helpful at any age. Absolutely. And I'll just highlight what we're talking about tonight are gene modifying treatments, but there's a lot of symptomatic treatments that are also coming down the pipeline as well that could potentially stand to benefit children, adults, individuals across the lifespan. Um, a clinical question here about, um, is there any risk of scar tissue with multiple intrathecal in, in, um, injections? Um, I think the risk is minimal. Um, most of the time it's, it's, it's not that different than drawing blood. Um, but of course, if you poked the exact same spot over and over and over again, um, I guess, you know, that, that place at the vein would probably not be happy about it. 
Um, but these, um, these injections are relatively infrequent, once every several months. So I think um, we probably wouldn't expect there to be a lot of local damage. Um, the type of needle that is used to deliver um, the, the product, the, the um, drug, is, is an atraumatic needle, we call it, which means it's, um, it's designed to be, um, it's, it's like a pencil point. It's, it's just going to go through and um, just separate, separate the tissues very gently as opposed to a, um, a cutting needle, which makes more of a slice. Um, so um, people are being careful about that, um, not necessarily because of the scarring risk, but because we don't want to put a big hole in, um, in the dura um, that will then go on to leak spinal fluid because we know from people who can talk to us and tell us about these things is that um, post lumbar puncture headache is a real phenomenon. And so using a tiny needle, an atraumatic needle, um, part of that is to minimize the risk that we will have a leak at the site afterward that could ultimately need to be treated. Great, and again, some of the things we were hearing about today were some creative ways to get around repeat lumbar puncture, um, lumbar puncture. So things like indwelling catheters that have just a subcutaneous um, access port where you would deliver the medication um, instead of through repeated intrathecal injections. Um, should the therapies prove safe and effective? And this becomes a reality that we're talking about dosing these medications on that sort of frequency. All right, a great question here about um, the monkeys that um, we're doing toxicity studies in. Do those monkeys have Angelman syndrome or are they neurotypical monkeys? And, or if they do have Angelman syndrome, are they given Angelman syndrome and then we're curing it, or taking it away? So there, there's no uh, primate, uh, non-human primate model of Angelman syndrome. So these are monkeys that don't have Angelman syndrome to start with. Um, and they are not given Angelman syndrome before they're given the, the ASO. Um, so it's, it's really um, a little bit of a different situation, but it's kind of as close as we can come. Um, if, if there were a monkey model of Angelman syndrome, um, that would be wonderful. I'm sure it's a non-trivial thing um, to try to make an animal model of any kind. And um, the bigger the animal and the longer the animal lives, the more expensive and hard it is. So um, there isn't a monkey model, um, but, um, but we still think that at least delivering the drug to um, the macaque monkeys can give us some information about toxicity. Great, thank you. All right, what does the general timetable look like for um, completion of a clinical trial like these? Months. <laughs> yes, a long time. <laughs> months and months and months. Right. People are being very careful and going very slowly and trying one dose and seeing if there's any side effects, any, any, anything that we need to be worried about before then inching up to the next dose. And then, you know, being very careful and reviewing all of the safety data before going to the next level. So that that puts you know, these necessary um, stops in, in the progress. We can't just enroll all 60 patients all at once. We've got to have this measured enrollment because we really need to be looking at the safety data very closely before you know, first do no harm is, is what we have to go by. Absolutely. All right, we have a lot of questions here. All right, so um, this is great. Keep them coming, guys. This is this is your time to get them answered. So, do we know how? Do we know if it will affect different children differently as each child is different? Do we expect a treatment to give the same response in every child or, or slightly different responses? I don't think we have a clue. Um, <laughs> I mean, we talked a little bit. Stormy talked a little bit about how those who are missing only UBE3A and don't have a deletion that, that lops out 
more genes um, might be expected to have a different type of um, experience. Um, those who have two copies to be woken up, they may need less of a dose. These are all questions to be answered. And then of course there's individual variability for pretty much every drug I can think of. There are side effects that happen very rarely only to a small percentage of people and you can't predict who's gonna get that. Um, and for many, many drugs, there are sort of responders and non-responders. So I think we have an awful long way to go before we're going to understand um, those things. But it's it's the reason why um, we, we've got to gather as much information as possible while we're doing these studies. All right, and perhaps you can also speak to this this group of questions. It, what does the process look like if a family decides they want to start getting involved in a clinical trial? And do, do families have a choice about which research study or clinical trial that they're involved in and, and who helps them make that decision? That's a great question. Um, I can tell you what happens at our site. Um, if, if a family approaches us and says they think they're interested, um, we give them the consent form to look at if there's a consent form available for the study. Um, if it's very early days and we don't have a consent form yet, we tell them what we know and then provide the consent form as soon as we have it. Um, and then we put their name on a list um, in the order that we receive the contact. Um, and we are sort of treating we have sort of one central list. And um, if your name is at the top of the list, then you're offered a spot for this study that happens to be open. But if you say, no, I, I think I don't wanna do that study. It makes me a little too nervous to think about a needle in my son's back. Um, just keep us on the list, but pass us by this time. Um, so that's the way we're doing it. Um, we're trying to be as, uh, fair um, and transparent as possible. Uh, some of the um, some of the uh, sponsors who are working in this space um, have given priority to folks who have participated in their those uh, sponsors' natural history studies. So you may have heard of Freesias, which was a study to, just to gather information. There was no treatment given. Um, but if you participated in Freesias, you have a um, kind of a priority status for the for the ASO trials. So, um, and that leads me to segue into natural history studies. Um, so that the natural history study, if you will, um, was a um, NIH funded um, study that ran from 2006 to 2014. Okay. And many of you participated in that. And thank you very much because uh, we have learned some really important stuff. Um, and um, especially those of you who may have had um, one or more EEGs done in the natural history study, we, we know how non-trivial that is and how painful it is to physically lay on your kid to keep him still while we have EEG electrodes on. But we actually have gotten some pretty um, interesting data from that. And it looks like the EEG may be that elusive biomarker that we've been seeking. So there are some features in the EEG of children with Angelman syndrome um, that do seem to correlate with performance. So specifically, um, the higher your amount of delta power is, which is, a, which is an, an, an abnormality that we see in Angelman syndrome, um, the, the, the lower your cognitive score was. So what we hope um, that, that this means is that we could potentially see a change in the EEG before we see any actual change in behavior or change in abilities that would tell us, aha, this is working, we're on the right track. 
Um, that's what we all hoped we would find some sort of biomarker. Obviously, if, if you could just do a you know finger prick and get a blood sample and and have something that was easy to measure like glucose there that would have been that would have been really swell. Um, it's not so easy to get an EEG. We understand that, but at least it seems to be that there might be something there that can serve as a surrogate so that we can we can know earlier than waiting six months to repeat the Bailey, um, whether or not we're on the right track, whether or not something seems to be improving. So the natural history study didn't end in 2014, the funding ended. Some of our sites continued to limp along um, and see patients until we, the new and improved natural history study came along um, in, and the funding is from the FDA and that began in 2017. Um, and we'll go through 2022, which is coming up soon. Um, but I think we, we all are hopeful that uh, another source of funding is gonna materialize or we'll, we'll sort of do the limp along thing like we did before because we're still mining that data. We are still learning things from the data that we collected in, 2000, in, in that last decade um, that, that we've had some industry partners who have looked at the data um, Biogen, Roche, um, th those, those folks help look at the EEG data and do some really powerful statistical analyses that, you know, was just beyond our capability to, um, to buy, even if we had the money to buy. So, um, so we're still learning new things. If you're interested in participating in the natural history study, anybody anybody on this call can get you to one of the sites and you can, we're trying to embed the ability to participate in the natural history study in all of the clinical ASF, uh, or in most of the ASF clinics, um, or at least so, some of them. So there are sites around the country and um, there's even now, one of the pluses of, um, of COVID was that we, we started to do these visits um, remotely um, because we had to. And so there's, um, there's a possibility of gathering much information with a remote visit. And then if you're able to come on site and do, um, do the stuff that has to be hands-on like the Bailey, um, that, that's possible. We, we even have a little tiny bit of travel support and a little tiny bit of a stipend that we offer families now. Um, so, Thanks to those of you who did it out of your goodwill um, in the past, but in the current situation, um, we can offer you just a tiny little token of appreciation. And I'll just give a plug here for um, the clinic network and the ladder database as well, um, as well as, so we get this question all the time of what families can do to um, help expedite drug development and participation in natural history studies is absolutely one of those things. You know, we know that this can be, um, it can be time intensive, it can be labor intensive, but um, when you participate in the natural history study, all that all that robust data that we have from that initial natural history study is now available to be utilized for drug development, whether that's, you know, through a pharmaceutical company or a, an academic researcher, there's um, a process by which um, they apply. And then that goes to a data access committee that's um, got representatives from uh, um, all the kind of key stakeholders, as well as parents who say, um, you know, is this an okay use of this data? Um, again, for drug development, for, for um, improving clinical care for Angelman syndrome. So um, when you spend your time participating in these studies, it really is incredibly beneficial to um, both patient care, but also um, drug development. Um, I mentioned ladder, when you um, go to an Angelman syndrome clinic, um, you will be asked if you want to participate in the ladder database. The ladder database is a way to make the clinic um, data that you're giving for clinical care um, go even further. It's a way to link that data with natural history data. It's a way to expand what we know about the natural history of Angelman syndrome and have even more um, robust data for drug development. 
And Amanda bit. just put in a plug for the global AS registry. So um, our hope is that all of these um, all of these entities that are gathering information that we will ultimately be able to merge those data. We're we're trying to gather um, enough information. Um, obviously, gender, sex, date of birth, um, place of um, place of birth, so that we can try to find you know, we cannot double count anybody um, when we when we want to try to amass all this data ultimately. But yes, the goal is absolutely to make all of these databases be able to talk to one another and be able to minimize the burden on families as much as possible. All right, we got some questions to get here with five minutes left before the top of the hour. So we're gonna blitz through here. All right, so great question here. If we can treat diabetes with a pump or seizures with an implant, can we opine about whether treatments like this might be a possibility in the future for Angelman syndrome? Well, um, I think that's, that's the hope, isn't it? I mean, um, you know, let's just say best case scenario um, we find that one or more of these ASOs um, work, you know, um, they turn on UBE3A, they ameliorate symptoms, they're safe, um, and they need to be given once every three months. So doing a spinal tap every three months for the rest of your life doesn't sound so much fun. So then we try to get an implantable catheter where, um, then it's just like drawing blood, except you're infusing something rather than taking the blood out. But it, you don't have to anesthetize somebody for that. Maybe in the Angelman population, we would implant something back here where it's not easily accessible and noticeable. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's the hope is that if we find something that works, um, then, then we do the hard work of figuring out how, how to deliver it better um, and making it better. You know probably not all ASOs are created equal and they're gonna be some that are better and maybe we can tweak the chemistry and make the ones that work last even longer so that it's even more time between needing to come back for injections. So um, I, I think there's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done to get there, but I like Stormy sort of feel like, wow, um, all the pieces are there. We just have to optimize each stage of it, each part of it. Um, and honestly, you know, I, I never thought in my professional lifetime that I was going to see us talking about a treatment for a neurodevelopmental disorder. So um, it's pretty phenomenal. Really exciting. Definitely, we should all be really excited about this for sure, where we've come in 2021. All right, there's a really important question we have to answer before we um, get done here, because I don't want to leave without answering this one. Do we anticipate that when successful therapeutics are discovered for deletion and mutation genotypes, that research will continue to include those with UPD and imprinting center defects? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, People rightly um, wanted to be cautious, not take any undue risks. So just, um, you know, stick, stick to those who only have one, one gene that we could wake up so that we don't risk any overexpression, which could have its own issues. But once we figure out um, the optimal dose for um, the deletion group, for example, then I think the next step you're gonna see is um, what modifications we need to make in that um, to make it accessible to everybody. Becky says, we as a community can, and I would say we'll make sure no genotype is left behind. Though I don't think that anybody has a plan to leave any of the genotypes behind. Everyone is appropriately focused on all genotypes for sure. All right, let's see. We have any burning questions here. 
some of these, I think we just, sadly, the answer on repeat is that we just don't know the answer to. How much time after an injection might we expect to notice improvements? I think these are questions that we are learning from these initial clinical trials, but, and hopefully we'll have more information about in the next six to 12 months, but right now just don't don't have answers to those. What are the chances that anti-seizure medications will mask the benefits of UB3 activation? Are we worried about that as a risk? Um, I haven't really thought about that. Stormy, can you think of a reason why that would be um, an issue? Um, you know, the, the, the ASO treatment would be very, very specific about waking up the paternal uh, UBE3A gene, um, and I and seizure medications don't actually act through a gene expression mechanism. So I wouldn't anticipate that there would be any interaction there we have to worry about. But um, obviously, I, I we're going to be gathering information on all the medications people are taking, um, mm. so that if there is a correlation there between people taking this didn't respond as well as people not taking that, we will hopefully be able to see that. I mean, as a, as a true bench scientist who doesn't know humans very well, um, the, you know, in the mouse, um, they did see that, that seizures are restored later in life by putting UBE3, seizures are corrected, seizure susceptibility is corrected by putting UBE3A back later in life. But again, it's about managing your child's health, I think. Um, and so I, I, I suspect they're not going to want to change the seizure meds right during these clinical trials. And so you, you may very well be right. We may not see whether or not the ASOs uh, help with the seizure disability, with the seizure issue, because your child's on seizure meds. That may very well be the case, right? Well, and Stormy and Len, I think if, correct me if I'm wrong, part of some of, sometimes some of the exclusion criteria is you can't add or change any medications while you're doing this trial, maybe because of some of that, right? Absolutely. People usually need to be on a stable um, set of medications for at least 30 days before entering. Um, and there's usually some exclusion criteria for, criterion for, um, you know, having, not having, not having seizures that are poorly controlled or not having any other health issue that the investigator thinks would make um, the person not a good candidate. So um, we try to have everybody in as steady a state as possible before enrolling because we want to see what the treatment's doing. We, we, and obviously everybody understands that if something unusual comes up, you're not going to not treat it. You know, you're going to, you're going to have to deal with whatever comes up, but at least to start with, you try to start with a population that is kind of in steady state and stable. Um, obviously, some of the trials that are enrolling younger children, we all know that the seizures don't um, may not have started already in some of those young younger kids, and so we may see that seizures happen um, even in the population that gets the ASO. Um, but that's the beauty of the natural history study is that we have a sense of when we see seizures and we will have that kind of backdrop to be able to interpret these things on. And I know that we're running close to time, Liz, but I think if one of you guys could answer this question, because I think it's important for the community to understand. Someone asked about, you know, there's a lot of companies repeating a lot of st studies, like, you know, there's three people doing ASOs. There's a lot of researchers thinking about CRISPR or looking at different things. Can you talk about the benefit of having multiple people working on different therapeutic treatments, but also multiple researchers working on, you know, the same type of maybe process, if that makes sense. Well, um, I, I personally, I sort of feel like the more the merrier. Um, I'm thrilled that we have more than one company that's got a product uh, that they want to bring to clinic, even if it's kind of operating on the same strategy. And, um, I'm not, you know, I'm sure that not all ASOs are created equal. It probably makes a big difference where along that non-coding RNA, 
you are targeting your ASO and probably the, the underlying chemistry, chemical mm -hmm. modifications that we make in these things that extend their, um, their half-life for how long they'll be still present and working in the body. Um, so I, you know, it would, I guess it would be great if we had one company doing ASO and one company doing another strategy and one company doing another strategy, because then you wouldn't have to maybe try to pick between which ASO, but honestly, um, it's an embarrassment of riches. I'm thrilled. All right, I think we have a, clarif a clarification in the question. Um, so it sounds like really more the question was repeat studies um, or multiple studies looking at kind of the natural history of angel uh, syndrome. Yeah, you know, um, we, um, we understand why some of the um, pharmaceutical companies have felt the need to do that. Um, we may not have captured um, all of the things that they wanted to capture. We're still looking for the perfect outcome measure. We are the first to admit that the Bailey and the Vineland don't do it. They don't capture what our kids are capable of, but we kind of are stuck with something that the FDA is willing to bless. Um, so I think some of these studies are looking for um, can we get a better EEG if we do it in the home? We certainly didn't even try to do that in the natural history study. That's hugely expensive. Um, can, we, can we get a better sense of sleep data if we use a wearable? We didn't try that in the natural history study. So some of these things, um, you know, is it, it really designed to get us um, one step further down the line about perfect outcome measures that are really gonna capture what we wanna capture. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's painful in a way to think about kind of reinventing that wheel, um, but it, it's not exactly the same wheel. Um, and I, there are some differences that are, you know, they, they are pushing us a little bit further down the line about what our perfect outcome measures are. And I just saw, when Han just put something in the chat that I, it was too fast for me to see. He is offering to do remote enrollment for the natural history study. So if there are folks who want to participate or there was a question in the chat about um, a child just recently had an EEG and but and they would like to contribute that EEG to the natural history study or to any ongoing research study, how could they do that when Han was offering to do remote enrollment? Yeah, so we, we'd have to actually consent you to enter this study. But like I said, you can you can only do the remote stuff if coming on site doesn't work for you and um, providing um, a copy of your EEG. It'll be usable if you get it de-identified. We cannot add it to the latter database with any personal information. That would be a violation of, of, of privacy laws. So if you've got an EEG that was done recently, you can request a copy on CD, but when you do that, request that it be de-identified. That's doable. Um, it will just give a bunch of letters and numbers in a random string um, rather than the birth date and, and name. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for taking the time tonight to answer these questions. Thank you to the community for coming out and asking wonderful questions. Keep them coming all week. Tomorrow night, we're, I will be joined by a team of medical doctors, and we will be addressing all things medical care. We're going to go systems-wise, so bring your questions, bring your medical questions, and we will, we will um, get them answered tomorrow night. So thank you, thank you to, oh, Amanda. No, go ahead. I, I just wanted to make sure also before, before I let Liz um, wrap it up, um, if you guys are, some of you have asked if you're, if you're interested in participating in a trial, make sure you go to our website, check out the clinics that we have and just reach out to the, the, some of the clinic, um, 
uh, coordinators to let them know, like, hey, I'm interested. What's the process of, of doing that? That was a question that has has come up to make sure you do that. Also, if you register in Ladder, which I put the link in the chat, it will also send out reminders and send out information when there are different clinical trials happening. So that's a really great way for you to get engaged in that as well. So yeah, go ahead, Liz. I just wanted to remind people about that. That's wonderful. I'll just say a final thank you to my panelists. You guys were fabulous. Thank you for your time. We're excited to see you guys tomorrow night. Don't miss it. And we'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Thank you guys. Have a good thank night. You. Good night.